I'd like to welcome everyone to our Azure Transformation webinar series. This is our inaugural webinar. This is episode one. Where do we begin? Well, I say probably a good place to start is here. And whether you are already in Azure and enjoying a lot of the features and functionalities and cost savings, this webinar will be chock full of information for you. If you are just getting started into Azure, this is going to be a good episode and good webinar series for you to understand where to begin and where you can go and begin saving on costs at the same time modernizing your environment. My name is Jeff Lizerbrom. I am a pre-sales solutions architect with Managed Solution, and I'm very happy to be here today presenting this content. For the agenda, what we'll be covering is, at first, some real world use cases. I mean, let's get right into it. Let's look at the impact that Azure Cloud Services has on our customers. For that, I'm also gonna invite a special guest, Tina Roundtree, our, our VP of Sales and Marketing, to really discuss some of these use cases. Then we're gonna get into, well, how did this all begin? And where do we begin? We're gonna give you some good examples of how to get started in Azure today. We'll move into getting acquainted with Azure Cloud Services. Now, whether it's infrastructure or platform or software as a service, Azure is huge. And this will give you just a good layout and lay of the land to understand what Azure Cloud Services are made up of. Now, you probably want to know a burning question of how much is this going to cost? We're going to get into that as well. And we'll give you a guided tour of Azure's portal interface with starting off with a demo of setting up a virtual machine and seeing how easy it is. And we're gonna finalize our discussion on what's next in Azure Cloud Services. And this will be part of our webinar series. Continuing episodes will cover and go deeper into what we're discussing. And throughout this episode, you're going to have a chance of asking questions. And if we can answer them live, we'll do so. Uh, if we can answer them after uh, the presentation is over, we'll be able to do that as well. So I look forward to you joining us and let's get started. Well, before we get into the thick of it, I wanted to bring up some real world use cases and how Azure Cloud Services have had good impact from a few of our customers. And for this discussion, I'm going to dial in Tina Roundtree from Managed Solution. So just hold on a second. Hi, Tina. How you doing? Hey, Jeff. I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Hey, for everyone to know, Tina is my boss. And I was wondering, Tina, if you can make a quick introduction of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Tina Roundtree. I am the VP of Sales and Marketing here at Managed Solution. I've been with the organization nine years now, and I manage sales, our sales teams, our marketing teams, our channel programs, and I sit on the senior leadership team. Excellent, thank you. And the reason why I brought Tina on the call here was that there were at least two case studies where Managed Solution helped uh, for our customers regarding Azure. Um, and the first one was actually a law firm who had a need to move to Azure virtual desktops. And Tina, can you maybe dive a little bit into that? Yeah, absolutely. So this customer called us, uh, they were struggling and they had already made the move from on-premise infrastructure into the cloud. They were in AWS at the time and they were running their virtual environment in uh, Citrix. And their CFO had uh, expressed a lot of frustration about their bill and their costs were just out of control. There's several hundred uh, users accessing this environment and um, costs were really high. So they gave us a call and they asked us if we would take a look at their environment and see if we could help assess what was going on and help them overall reduce their cloud spend. And so we did this for them. And um, what we learned is that if they migrated away from AWS into Azure, that they could save a considerable amount just by leveraging Microsoft's 
reserved instances for customers. They knew they weren't going to leave the cloud. They weren't going anywhere. So they were happy to have that commitment in order to get a reduced spend. So they um, hired us. We migrated their environment in Citrix running on Azure as essentially phase one of this project. Uh -huh. um, about a year later, they called again because they were frustrated with the way that the Citrix environment was functioning. And when we looked into it, we realized that their Citrix licensing hadn't been, uh, wasn't up to date. They're a couple years behind in version. Um, and for those of you that know, you know that Citrix is super expensive if you get in that situation. And so they asked us what they could do. And so we put a project together to move them into Azure virtual desktop. And when they did the cost comparison, it actually ended up being less expensive because they already had Azure Virtual Desktop as part of their Microsoft licensing. So it was less expensive to migrate them to Azure Virtual Desktop than it was to renew their Citrix licensing. So they ended up hiring us to do that. And so we moved them over into Azure Virtual Desktop and now we um, manage that environment for them and support their end users as they access that cloud environment. That's amazing. I mean, that's a story that we hear a lot of consolidating services uh, with customers who already own the licensing and only to realize they're using something that's redundant. Um, and so that, that's a really good story there. And I know that there's an, another customer of ours who is in the water conservation business who utilizes Internet of Things, IoT, and they also had an Azure need. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, this customer, I mean, I have to say I love working with them. They're so passionate about water conservation and their mission is to make sure that, you know, um, we understand how important it is to conserve water on the planet. And so their business is built around that. They, for the first 30 years of their operations, they had this on-premise infrastructure, right? They were kind of ahead of the game when it comes to IoT because they were building these sensors and gathering this data and they created this huge environment. Um, they didn't have any cloud services at all. And a few years ago, they had a fire and they had to literally pull their servers out of the data center and oh my. them in a vehicle. I know. So they <laughs> realized at that point that they needed to build in better redundancy. They didn't want to have this, you know, single point of failure for their business any longer. And so they decided to look into a cloud solution and they landed on Microsoft Azure. And they did because it made sense at the time, like all of their uh, servers are Windows servers. So they were versed in Windows technology. They understood it. They still needed to get up to speed on how to use Azure, but it was a much smaller leap from on-prem to Azure than it would have been on-prem to another large public cloud. Yeah, and and this is a case where, you know, some companies, you know, want to move. They they want to lift and shift. Uh, word on the street now, it's move and improve uh, to Azure and yeah. really kind of get rid of the on-premises environment. But sometimes they're forced into it like this story. Uh, which is amazing. And it was a good, good thing that we were able to help and bring them back on their feet. Yeah, I mean, the, the infrastructure was old, so they needed to do something anyways. They'd had that fire scare. Um, and so, you know, the driver was we need sustainable architecture. But they were also interested in some of the services that Azure provides. And I think sometimes with move and improve customers, this can often get overlooked, right? They wanted to do data warehousing, they wanted to do data analytics, and all of this technology sits in Azure once you get up there. So they were ripe to take advantage of that, and um, we were able to help them migrate, and now they run their environment up in Azure. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing those stories. I really appreciate it, and taking time out of your busy day. Um, so thanks again. Oh, absolutely. You know me, I love, I love talking about this stuff. So thanks so much for having me on. All right, have a good day. Thanks, Jeff, I'll talk to you soon. The first thing we probably wanna go into is how did this all begin? You know, how did Azure kind of get its footprint to the cloud? And I, I think we have to have a discussion really about where we came from. I'm sure 
in your experience, certainly in my experience, we've all been in data centers, in server rooms, maybe even some wiring closets. And really, there's a, a big on-premises footprint. Probably think of this as the OSI model in the day, uh, where we had our physical and transport all the way up to the session and application layer. And this is very similar here, where we were really responsible, you know, as perhaps a systems engineer to manage all of this. Uh, I'm sure we both had some pretty uh, daunting experiences in the day. When we're thinking about moving our resources to the cloud, the next level is really infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service, or IaaS, is the process where Microsoft can manage your virtualization, servers, storage, and networking for you. Now, there is some responsibility on your side to be able to, you know, configure some networking and storage accounts and things like that. But in reality, the physical nature of this is really Microsoft managed. What you manage is the type of operating system you want to put on there, any kind of middleware, runtime libraries, how your data is going to connect, and your applications on how that's going to integrate. The next level is platform as a service. Now this goes up a little bit more in the layers here where runtime, middleware, and the operating system are already taken care of for you. All you need to do is focus on your data and applications. Now on the most extreme level is software as a service. And this is also a very nebulous area because there are thousands and thousands of applications in the Azure marketplace that meet what is known as a software as a service. But the reality is, is that Microsoft manages the whole thing for you, including everything from networking to applications. Really, there's going to be always a level of responsibility any organization is going to have to have in order to control, configure, and monitor and manage these resources here. In our upcoming webinars, we're going to be covering platform and software as a service models a little bit more in depth. But for today, we're really focused on infrastructure as a service. And this is typically where we get started. Now, I remember the days where walking into a data center, we would often come into this type of situation. It was kind of a mess, wasn't it? Or Sometimes we had to go through and contend with plugging in things in the back of servers and trying to find areas along the floor where you know we can make room and you know get things done and this is definitely not ideal. So what we're really looking at is we're moving our on-premises environment to where Microsoft can manage it for us. So no longer do we need to contend with you know, complex data centers or cabling and racking and stacking and virtualization of servers. This is where Microsoft provides a storage account to get started, a resource group to help automate the creation of your virtual network and your server resources. Now, as good as Microsoft Azure infrastructure as a service is, our customers are actually jumping right into artificial intelligence. And what does Azure have to do with AI? What does it offer? And where do we start with it? Now, we're not going to go real deep into the woods here with artificial intelligence in this episode. I think it's going to deserve a dedicated episode to talk about AI capabilities but it is important to know where it came from. Artificial intelligence was born out of New Hampshire when Alan Turning came up with the great expectations that started the whole thing. Artificial intelligence. 1970s and 1980s, while there was a lot of research and development, there was actually unfilled promises. So there was a little bit of a lag. So it wasn't really until the 1990s when AI actually became an industry. And we started with artificial narrow intelligence. Moving into the 2000s, it became part of the deep learning active research. And in the 2010s, cloud computing and big data really started booming here. This is when we started moving to the cloud and data lakes were being formed in the cloud and just tons of data could be integrated within AI. 
2011 to 2016, this is when business was a booming, I tell you. This is when IBM Watson beat the Jeopardy! champions in February 2011. Apple Siri came out, followed by Amazon Alexa, Microsoft Cortana, Google Assistant. So all of these assistants were coming out all really much around the same time. And neural long short-term memory networks were really being developed, much like human behavior, word embeddings, attention models. And it wasn't until 2017 and now to the present when we're seeing things like Google Brain and auto machine learning cloud. So Microsoft Azure has its auto machine learning in terms of classification, regression, forecasting, translation, machine reading comprehension. So there's a lot of capabilities that are coming out with Azure AI at the moment. Now it's early still in its phases, but it's be being developed quicker than ever. And it's a very revolutionary time. So with all of this artificial intelligence and Azure infrastructure, you can imagine that Azure needs to be a pretty big thing. And as you can see from this map here, and one of my former colleagues even mentioned that Azure is big. I mean, really big. And you can see here that there's 200 physical data centers in various global regions. It's arranged in up to 78 regions. Regions are sets of data centers. Among those, uh, there's 113 availability zones. This provides that high uptime, high resiliency, business continuity. It's linked by over get this, 175,000 miles of terrestrial and subsea fiber optic networks. Believe it or not, that is the diameter of Saturn's rings. And there is 5 million petabytes in growing of storage. Now, I can't even, sometimes I can't fathom even what a terabyte is sometimes, but a petabyte and let alone 5 million petabytes, that is a lot of storage. So you can see with the vastness of Azure and the credibility of the product that you're going to see some good uptime, some good business continuity um, for your data. And uh, I also wanted to mention that not only does Azure services in, you know, sit on these data centers, but also Microsoft 365. So productivity is also a big part of this. So as big as Azure is, there's also a lot of services that are provided. Now, Microsoft has a handy flow chart, so whether you wanna migrate or build new, we can use this as a tool. Let's go ahead and start from the, uh, the beginning here, and we're gonna focus really mainly on the right side of this chart where all the services are listed and give you a description of what each and every one of these really does. Now, if you want to reference this chart on your own, you can scan the QR code, which will bring you to the website at Microsoft, which allows you to choose an Azure Compute Service. Azure Virtual Machines is a service where you deploy and manage virtual machines inside an Azure Virtual Network, something that we're all pretty familiar with. Azure Batch is a managed service for running large-scale, parallel, and high-performance computing applications. When you see HPC workload, this is where it's at. Azure Spring Apps makes it easy to deploy Spring Boot applications to Azure without any code changes. It manages the infrastructure of Spring applications, so developers can really just focus on their code. Azure Functions is a serverless solution that allows you to write less code, maintain less infrastructure, and save on costs. Instead of worrying about deploying and maintaining servers, the cloud infrastructure provides all of the up-to-date resources needed to keep your applications running. Azure App Service is an HTTP-based service for hosting web applications, REST APIs, and mobile backends. You can develop it in your favorite language, whether it's .NET, .NET Core, Java, PHP, Python, and so forth. The app service, it adds the power of Microsoft Azure to your application so that you can have security, load balancing, auto scaling, 
and automated management. If you prefer not to manage any virtual machines, containers are actually becoming the preferred way to package, deploy, and manage cloud applications. Azure Container Instances offers the fastest and simplest way to run a container in Azure. The Azure Service Fabric is a distributed systems platform that makes it easy to package, deploy, and manage scalable and reliable containers and microservices. Service Fabric also addresses a lot of the challenges in developing and manage cloud native applications. Azure Red Hat OpenShift extends Kubernetes, which we're going to get to next. But running containers in production with Kubernetes requires additional tools and resources. So Azure Red Hat OpenShift is jointly engineered, operated, and supported by Red Hat and Microsoft to provide an integrated support experience. Azure Kubernetes Service, AKS for short, simplifies deploying a managed Kubernetes cluster in Azure by offloading the operational overhead to Azure. As a hosted Kubernetes service, Azure handles critical tasks like health monitoring and maintenance. When you create an AKS cluster, a control plane is automatically created and configured. And finally, Azure Container Apps is a fully managed environment that helps you run microservices and containerized applications on a serverless platform. Common uses of Azure Container Apps include API endpoints deployment, hosting background processing jobs, handling event-driven processing, and running microservices. Now, when it comes to moving to Microsoft Azure, no matter if you're moving to IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS solutions, there's the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework to be able to follow. And this is a good best practice to really get from the beginning aspects of your project. First off, you want to define your strategy. What are your motivations for moving to Microsoft Azure? Is it simply because it's cool, or is there a benefit of reducing on-premises footprints and data centers and servers and, and have Microsoft manage those? What type of business outcomes are you trying to achieve? Is it for process management, efficiency? And what is the business justification? Because there will be some costs involved for sure, especially operational costs. And prioritizing the project is equally as important. How prioritized is it to lift and shift or to move to a platform in Azure? Now, planning involves understanding your digital estate. You know, what type of resources are you trying to modernize or move to the cloud? And is this plan in alignment with your original organizational plans? Also, think about the skills that you have within your organization. Do you have the skill sets to be able to support this? Or do you have managed services providers or other aspects to be able to help support this? And what will be your cloud adoption plan? Adoption is really key here because at times when you're moving to the cloud, there's going to be changes and end users will be impacted in one form or another. So you need to come up with some type of adoption plan to help support your users. And when you're ready to move to the cloud, there are a ton of resources to help you prepare and be ready to move to Azure. There's the Azure Readiness Guides, plus those flow charts that we saw before, plus additional resources. Now, you also want to understand what you want to start moving. What is that first landing zone going to be? What is that first workload that's going to migrate? You want to also expand the blueprint. Think about expanding beyond that first landing zone and then always follow best practice and validate it. Once you're in the cloud, and maybe you're just beginning the journey there, it's important to start adopting it. Now, migrating involves getting that first workload out there, starting to expand those scenarios, and then again, continually validating the best practices and process improvements. Now, from there, there's a whole bunch of other things once you're in the cloud. This is where innovation really 
starts taking place, you know, these are things that we can think about now. We can start talking about artificial intelligence and process improvements and, uh, again, different expanded scenarios that you can do for your business. Now, all of this can't really be done without mentioning a good governance and management plan. When talking about governance and management, we want to talk about the methodology, how we're going to benchmark, how we're going to do the initial best practices, and how we're going to mature over time. And really for management, how are we going to sustain operations once we're in the cloud? This is where you know certain processes actually might need to be a little bit more mature um, as far as business growth and business commitments. So back at the beginning of the cloud adoption framework, there's this business justification, right? So the burning question is, how much is Azure going to cost? And the answer is, uh, well, I don't really have a drum roll here, but really, it depends. <laughs> Sorry to burst your bubble, but it really does depend on several factors. First factor is the pricing model. Uh, and then what are the advanced analytics or web apps or container services you might be using? Are you going to be using data warehouse? What type of Azure infrastructure are you building? And are you going into AI machine learning platforms? Now, for this, there is a pricing calculator that's really handy. And that QR code that you see on the right side of the screen here is for you to explore on your own. It'll take you right over to the Azure pricing calculator. But before we think about expenses, uh, we want to think about what is the different Azure spend models? You know, what are you going to use in order to get the best bang for your buck? And there's a few different avenues to go down. There's a simple pay as you go, uh, and this is great for small businesses or for basic use. You can utilize a cloud solution provider like us, like Managed Solution, because if you have a trusted partner, this is great for special offers, personalized service, great for small businesses and large enterprises alike. Enterprise agreements are probably the least flexible, often a three-year commitment, and you've got some regular true-ups to do, but for very large enterprises, it can save a lot of money. And finally, there's what's called Azure Reserved Instances, which is a, a good use case is when you're using like Azure Virtual Desktop Instances. And these are paid in a one or three year dedicated purchase requiring a one-time upfront payment. But this often includes significant discounts as compared to say like the pay-as-you-go models. Well, here we are in the Azure Pricing Calculator. And as you can see, it looks fairly intuitive. In fact, uh, if you wanted to see what the pricing was for a virtual machine, storage accounts, app services, Azure Functions, uh, it's pretty much all there. What we're going to do is we're going to start by creating a virtual machine cost estimate. And as you can see, it creates an estimate as you scroll down. Right away, you're going to see that my monthly cost is $137.24, but that might not be the actual machine that we want to create. We might want something a little bit beefier. As you can see, this one contains uh, you know, two CPUs, eight gigs of RAM. I might need something a little bit more powerful. Another thing I wanted to point out was that you might get these pop-ups with like limited time offer, save up to 50% and so forth. Actually, these things are worth looking at because it could save you a lot of money. When we estimate machines, we want to first choose the region. And this is very much like we're building the machine itself, but we're not. We're really getting an estimate of the cost there. So we want to choose Windows, say, uh, I want to choose this as OS only. I don't need SQL or BizTalk server. And we'll keep this at a standard tier. Now, as far as the category goes, what do you want to use this machine for? Uh, do you want it to use it for optimized computing, general purpose, maybe even high performance compute? Let's go ahead and we're gonna select general purpose for this case. 
And as far as the instance goes, I would like to choose something that's fairly popular, which is the DV3 series. And as far as the instance goes, I'm going to need something a little more powerful, I think. So let me go into the, say, 8 gigs, I'm sorry, 32 gigs of RAM, 200 gigs of temporary storage. I think that's a pretty good size for starters there. And you can see that there's an estimate per hour of what that server entails. Now, I just need one virtual machine to start off. I, I'm going to run this pretty much all year, so 730 hours per month. And this is where we get into how you want to pay for it. Is it pay as you go? Or would you like to go on a savings plan to get maybe some additional discounts? Actually, if you lock yourself into like a three-year savings plan, there's quite a, big, uh, quite a big savings there you can get. What type of reserved instances do you want? And if, in case you don't know what that reserved instance is, you can always click on the informational button to get more information. One thing I wanted to point out was that when you're thinking about the cost estimate, you may not be purchasing it directly from Microsoft. You might be purchasing it through a CSP provider or maybe through an EA, but this is a good way to start to figure out what that cost estimate is, whether you're going directly with Microsoft as a pay-as-you-go or through another mechanism. The licensing. If you want to include the licensing that's included with the machine, great. If you want to bring your own license, use the Azure Hybrid Benefit. That's going to help you reduce costs, especially if you have your own licensing. Manage disks. Well, for this, I'm going to just choose my standard disk. Uh, we'll keep it at uh, 32 gig. In fact, I'm going to add a single 32 gig disk to this just to have some additional storage there. As far as snapshots go, uh, what we want to know is how do you want to configure snapshots? Uh, how redundant do you want it? So there are some choices there. For now, we'll disable it. Now, storage transactions are a little tricky. Uh, you might not know what a storage transaction actually is, but think about it as when you read files, when you write the files, when you delete files from a server. That's what a transaction is. And as you can imagine, exchange can be pretty heavy on transactions. So if you're planning on building an exchange server, look up how many potential transaction units per month it might take. From there, we're going to move on over to support. Now, the support, there's obviously support included with your subscription. But if you want to bump it up to something, maybe a professional direct or a standard, you can get some more information on what is entailed there. Finally, I have my estimated cost. This server is going to cost me about $343.18. Now, this can fluctuate depending on usage, but that's about my monthly rate that I expect to spend on this server. So as you can see, there's a really good case for going to Azure Infrastructure. First off, the price. As you saw from the pricing calculator, the costs are very flexible, whereas if you had a traditional VM environment, you're looking at more like fixed costs. For a hybrid solution, it's easy to move workloads back and forth from your data center to Azure servers and back, whereas traditional VMs, you're really stuck on your local servers. Now, the next one's really important. In terms of security, there's 24-hour monitoring going on. There's intrusion prevention, and these are all ISO certified data centers that Azure is running on. And in a traditional environment, most companies can't even come close to what Microsoft offers for security. As we go down the list, you can see in terms of maintenance, the openness of it, the speed of setting it up, as well as the licensing flexibility is really all there. So really, there is a lot of benefit for going to Azure infrastructure. Now that we've seen the comparison of running Azure versus virtual machines in a traditional sense, let's go ahead and go over to portal.azure.com to start building our first virtual machine. So we're going to move over to portal.azure.com where you can see all of the services, including virtual machines, resource groups, app services, storage accounts, and so on. 
But what's really cool is that you can actually get a glance of Azure AI services, and it's chock full of innovation and ideas to help bring AI to the forefront. And again, we'll be covering this in future episodes. For now, let's go back to all services and load up that virtual machine. One thing I wanted to mention is that if you sign up with Azure from the beginning, you can get $200 in credit of free services. It's pretty generous. It gives you some hours and some time and resources to be able to explore Azure here. We're gonna go ahead and create that first Azure virtual machine. And from here, it just walks you through pretty simple step-by-step -step. Now, I have an existing resource group, but you can create a new resource group to get things started. And here's where we name the server, and we'll select the region of where it will be located. Now, since I'm in the West US side, I'll prefer to host it a little bit closer to my locale. And the availability options and security types are all listed here. Now, there's quite a few different options here. There's standard security type, and then there's the trusted launch virtual machines, which really gives you that trusted platform module option. Now the fun really begins in terms of selecting your operating system. And you can see there's quite a few images to your avail. There's a Windows Server 2022 data center edition. That's what we'll choose for this one. Now, if you want to get some additional discounts, it's worth exploring some of these informational items. Check the box if you want to get some additional discounts, kind of research what that entails. And here's where we're going to select the size of the machine. Now, when we were building out the pricing calculator earlier, we saw that you know I was interested in the, the D series version three. So for that, I'm going to scroll down to where that is located. And it is there at the very end. Uh, it looks like the D-Series version three. And you'll see all those options, whether I want two cores with eight gigs of memory, four cores with 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, these are the options here. I say, let's give it a little bit more power I mean, not sure if 16 gigs will cut it, but we'll choose this one for demo purposes here. And we'll go ahead and select it. And this is where we put in the admin account. Let's go ahead and uh, do that. Make sure the passwords match. And then there are some inbound ports that you'll want to select. Now, by default, 3389 is supported here. And... Keep in mind, all traffic from the internet is gonna be able to hit that port 3389. So you definitely wanna go into some advanced networking to help you know, try to tie that down. Now here, what I'm showing you are the storage and the networking choices here. So there are some things that we can do to keep this a little bit more tied down. Now, for the most part, I'm gonna select the defaults, but as you can see, you have an internal IP address in a slash 24 range, and you also have a public IP address that's gonna be accessed by port 3389, RDP. It will give you that warning, but you, all, you, you can also add HTTP, HTTPS, and so forth. Let's go ahead and continue down the line here. If you want some additional load balancing capabilities, this is where you do it. Next in management, what do you want to do in terms of management? Well, it's always a good idea to have some Defender for Cloud to help protect your investments. If you wanted to add some additional identity, maybe there's something tied in with Active Directory or Azure AD or the identities that are tied to your Microsoft 365 environment here. And in monitoring, what do we want to do? Do we want to create some alert rules uh, do you want some boot diagnostics? We're going to create the, uh, the defaults here, and we'll go into the advanced section. In the advanced section, we can look at running extensions. If you wanted to maybe customize some of the data that gets delivered to your servers, uh, perhaps there's some additional things that you want to do to save some money. 
Now, if you wanted to add some tags, we can do that. We're not going to do that here. We're just going to review and create it. And as you can see, that the cost is going to be about 38 cents per hour to run this machine. And again, it gives you the warning. RDP ports are open to the internet. Uh, so later on, we might want to go in and uh, tie that down a little bit more. And let's complete reviewing all of the things. Um, once it passed the validation, you can review that info. And here we go, we'll create it. Now, this will take a few minutes to do. I sped it up just for time purposes. And you can see as it's deploying, it's giving you the deployment details of where it's at. Really, this is taking under about three or four minutes of time to actually do. And now the deployment has succeeded. Here we can review again all of the deployment details that took place. What's interesting here, we can use the inputs and outputs to create a template to deploy the next machine and next machine. So it's going to use JSON outputs to be able to apply to any desired state configuration of your choice. Finally, let's go into our virtual machine itself. As you can see, it's running. And if we select the machine, we have a lot of capabilities here to manage the machine. Whether you're, you want to start it, restart it, stop it, delete it, uh, even if you want to uh, you know, change some of the services and work with those or do some maintenance. But for now, we're going to go right into the machine. So let's go ahead and connect. And the connect button is either below settings or just on top there. And there's the IP address that we can use, or you can select using native RDP. So here's the RDP file that it provides. And as soon as it's done creating that RDP file, we can download it and run it. So because I have two screens, I have to constantly pull these over. So we'll connect to the machine. You can see that I'm putting in my credentials here. And we'll go ahead and launch that RDP session. And as you can see, the machine is running, it's logging in, and there you go. So as you can see, you have a full Windows Server 2022 Data Center Edition right here at your fingertips. Probably took uh, less than 10 minutes to, uh, to stand up. Uh, what's nice about this is that the infrastructure is maintained and managed mostly by Microsoft. So a lot of that responsibility is off lifted from me and onto Microsoft. And you can quickly deploy additional machines using templates. Hopefully this overview of Azure services was helpful, whether you are building a new infrastructure, going to Azure services for the first time, or if you have existing Azure infrastructure and wanting to move and improve and lift and shift additional things or boost some of the services that you're currently using. I wanted to cover a little bit about Managed Solution, who we are, why we do IT and where we're going. Uh, we are technology-obsessed humans. We're transforming the employee experience every day. And we do it because we think we can make lives better through technology. We think we can allow people to connect better with technology and experiences. And where are we going with all of this? Well, we are creating positive social impacts every day. Uh, we are trying to achieve limitless collaboration. And we want to make sure that you know, connections are always improving and are much easier, especially in today's hybrid work environment. We are both an award-winning help desk through our managed services team, and we support a strong role in Microsoft specialties through our professional services teams. Our credibility really kind of shows here. We are a gold Microsoft partner and tons of awards under our belt. And as a solutions partner, we can help you in several aspects. Whether you want to fast track your solution 
whether you want to get some licensing expertise and find out where you can save, if you're looking to do some Azure data center optimization, maybe you want to get some training. We do customer immersion experiences quite frequently. And whether you are a government or nonprofit, we can support you in that aspect as well. Now, we also provide Microsoft technology for social impacts, and we want to make sure that we continue down that path as well. So hopefully this was helpful again. We once again, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions and answers, we will get to them. Thank you so much.